From this wider perspective, so much of what we do to each other must have the rest of creation shaking their heads in disbelief. The fact is that someone born in the United States is not more special than someone born in Mexico. Someone born in London is not more special than someone born in Liverpool. Someone who is uh, white is not more special than someone who is black. They're just vehicles for the consciousness to experience. If you go down to the seashore and you pick up a droplet of water in your hand, how can anyone say that that droplet is any more or less special than all the other billions and trillions of droplets you see in the ocean before you? So when I began to understand all this, and appreciate this other explanation to dogmatic religion and this world is all there is science, I started to ask a, a few questions of uh, this situation. Like, how come that this explanation, at the very bottom line least, is as credible as the other two? How come the other two get guaranteed airtime, often no questions asked, here's your airtime, say what you like, and the alternative to both of them is ridiculed, condemned, or suppressed by reflex action? The answer that I came up with was that clearly some people don't want the public to have access to this information. But who and what and why? And I began to ask other questions. Like, I don't know about you, but I've met a lot of people in my life and I can't, to my knowledge, recall anyone who wanted a war who had any interest in wars, who felt that wars were anything but horrific and to be avoided. So I thought, how come the world's been awash with wars throughout this century? Who's behind them? Or what? Or why? Then I kind of looked at this economic system that controls the world. An economic system that is so sane that the more successful it is in its own terms, the quicker it destroys the planet. It's the perfect environmental and human assassin. It insists every year that we take more from the earth even quicker, turn it into even more things, sell even more things, consume even more things, throw away even more things to worship the real God of the modern world, economic growth. It insists that every year, 20% of the people of the world consume 80% of the resources, while leaving the other 80% to get by on the other 20%. Crazy. Of course it is. But that's the economic system, take, make and throw away, that controls your life and mine. And that of 6 billion people nearly. So I thought, What's behind this self-destruction? Or who and why? I started to look at some of the other uh, conventional wisdom that we pass on from generation to generation as the only way of doing things in this world. The wisdom that says, even though the economic system that I've just described is dismantling this planet... You ask a politician of any party anywhere in the world, what do we do to get out of this environmental situation? And they will say, we must have more uh, growth to raise the money to spend on the environment. If I said to you, the way to put out a fire is to pour more petrol on it, you'd say he's out of his mind. But that's what the politicians are saying when they say about more growth to sort out the environment. It's conventional wisdom that it's fine to treat animals as mere commodities, to be made as fat as possible, as quick as possible, on as little food as possible, to condemn every year 
billions of animals to a lifetime of pain, fear and suffering in the name of economics. You're sane if you judge your success in healthcare, not by how many people are healthy, but by how many diseased people you manage to treat. We're treating more patients than ever before. Why? Why are so many people ill? It's conventional wisdom that rising house prices are a sign of economic success when thousands are homeless because they can't afford them. You're sane, finally, if you think it's fine to support a system that is so successful that every year it turns out more suicide, alcoholism, drug taking, homelessness, pain, stress, fear and suffering in all its forms. We'd be in real trouble if this system wasn't working, wouldn't we? That is sanity, apparently. But it's the ultimate insanity. So who's behind it? Or what and why? I began to realize, too, that against the background of this utter self-destruction, on this same planet is stunning wisdom. And I began to see also that there is a great difference between cleverness and wisdom. They're not the same thing. This system is very clever, but it isn't very wise, and it's the lack of wisdom that is the problem. And I began to see that what we call wisdom is often not found in this state-of-the-art letters-after-their-name system. It's actually found in the native peoples that this system would see as backward. Piece of Native American wisdom, what have become known as American Indians. When you have cut down the last tree and poisoned the last river, you will know that you cannot eat money. That's wisdom. And there's another piece of very famous American Indian wisdom. In 1854, a, uh, the American government made an offer for Indian land. And under the system that I've been talking about and the attitudes and the values that are indoctrinated into us, what should have happened is this chief should have said, right, well, I'm, I'm on a winner here because it's a seller's market. I never put it on the market, therefore I'm in the driving seat. So what I'll do is duck and weave, and I'll crack on. I don't want to sell. Get them to push up the price. And at the moment that I think they're going to pull out, I'll put out my hand and say, and say you've convinced me. And people will think, oh, what a great businessman he is. That chief, fantastic. If he's something in the city, he will. But there's another value system on this planet also. A value system that said this in terms of this chief. How can you buy or sell the sky? We do not own the freshness of the air or the sparkle on the water. How then can you buy them from us? Every part of the earth is sacred to my people, holy in their memory and experience. We know the white man does not understand our ways. He's a stranger who comes in the night and takes from the land whatever he needs. The earth is not his friend, but his enemy. And when he's conquered it, he moves on. He kidnaps the earth from his children. His appetite will devour the earth and leave behind a desert. If the beasts were gone, we would die from a great loneliness of the spirit. For whatever befalls the earth, befalls the children of the earth. It's sobering to think that those words were spoken in 1854 when you look what has happened since. 